Good afternoon, and thank you for attending today's webinar on the Blight Elimination Funding Program. My name is Lisa Bank, and I'm the Communications and Training Specialist here at CEDAM, the host of today's webinar. I am pleased to introduce our presenter, Courtney Knox, with the Center for Community Progress. Also joining us today is Tanya Young from MISHTA, who will be able to help answer any questions regarding the program that you may have. Welcome, and thank you both for joining us. Without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Courtney Knox. Welcome, Courtney. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, as Lisa mentioned, my name is Courtney Knox. I'm with the Center for Community Progress. We are a national nonprofit organization that works on vacant and abandoned property issues um, and <clears throat> have been speaking with MISHA over the last few months um, regarding their blight elimination program. And so Tanya Young is on the phone, as Lisa had mentioned, to answer any specific questions related to the compliance of the actual blight funding. And my role today is really to go over how to utilize tax foreclosures to get those properties into the blight pipeline um, for um, demolition. So thank you to the Michigan Vacant Properties Campaign and also to CEDAM for hosting this webinar today. And with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So over the course of the next 45 minutes, we're going to go over the blight elimination program key components, the timeline to get tax foreclosed properties into the pipeline, how to utilize your city, county, or state land bank, and then also how to prepare for future projects. So if you're not ready this year for, to apply for blight elimination funding, how can you prepare this year in order to apply for future funding opportunities? Okay, so some key components um, of the blight elimination program. Hopefully you've all had a chance to review the NOFA and the guidelines for the blight funding that MISHTA has sent out. There was a link in the email. It's also available on MISHTA's homepage, um, and that will answer some very specific questions. So now I'm just going to highlight some of those. Who is actually eligible for blight funding? It's non-entitlement local units of government. Again, that's non-entitlement communities. The minimum request is $50,000 with a 25% match. The site selection must be zoned residential. And the blight activities must positively impact residential neighborhoods, key centers, nodes, and corridors. The properties that you're looking at for blight elimination funding must be located in CDBG low to mod non-entitlement areas and designated as blight based on MISHTA's definition. And so just to reiterate um, the, the definition of blight, it must be considered a public nuisance according to local code or ordinance. It's a nuisance because of age, physical condition, or use, or has had utilities, plumbing, heating, or sewage disconnected, destroyed, removed, rendered ineffective so that the property is in unfit for intended use. You also must have local support so a formal blight designation letter from qualified municipal manager, the assessor, or a code enforcement in the community that you're planning to work in. And you also must demonstrate site control, that the property is publicly owned by a deed or certificate of foreclosure naming the foreclosing governmental unit as owner. <clears throat> so now I'm going to talk about the timeline to actually get tax foreclosed properties into the pipeline. For any of you who have been um, or are working at the county, um, particularly in the treasurer's office, this has been a busy week for you because this is foreclosure week. So residents, uh, property owners had until March 31st to pay their delinquent taxes, and as of yesterday, the foreclosing governmental unit is now the proud owner of several properties in your communities. So on April 1st, the foreclosing governmental unit forecloses on tax delinquent properties. April 14th through the 25th, you'll see I have highlighted with a star, is when the blight component applications are actually due. And so we'll revisit this in a minute. The first Tuesday in July is the deadline for governmental agencies' right of refusal process. So April 1, the treasurer forecloses. The state has the first right of refusal followed by the local unit, followed by the county. Those, the state has
has until that first Tuesday in July to actually take their right of refusal. Not very often do we see the state step in and take properties, but it does happen. That's followed by um, the county auctions, July through November. Um, is when the, the second right of refusal process will happen. The first Tuesday in November is the deadline for the completion of all auctions. This includes both the minimum bid auctions and the no minimum bid auctions. December 1st is the deadline for the foreclosing governmental unit to transfer a list of unsold properties um, to the city, township, or village. And then on December 30th is the deadline for the local units to actually reject any properties that weren't sold at the auctions. And on December 31st, if they're not sold at the auction, all the taxes are canceled, properties are transferred to the local unit, or rejected and transferred to a land bank authority if, in those, if there's a land bank authority existing in those counties. So the important pieces as it relates to the blight funding that is the opportunity MISHA is offering right now has to do with our time period right now. Um, April 1st through April 25th, essentially, when you're filling out your blight uh, applications. So what is it that you can be doing right now? Um, first, review the blight elimination program's component compliance guidelines. Familiarize yourself on exactly what MISHA is looking for as far as properties go, as far as the site selection and the blight activities that are available. You can start gathering information on your potential inventory. So info from the county, any properties that are, that are currently hold, that held or publicly owned. Set up a meeting or have a call with your land bank to find out what properties they have in their inventory, as well as any CDCs and local units of government. April 1st was the deadline. County Treasurer's Office are probably still weeding through all of the properties that they tax foreclosed on yesterday. Um, I would still encourage you to do the timeline that you have a conversation if you're interested in looking at that list. They will tell you that it's probably a tentative list. Um, sometimes reversals will happen over the course of the next month. Um, if there's any bankruptcies, if there's improper notice, sometimes that the foreclosure will be reversed. And so the list won't be absolutely final, um, but it will give you a good indication of, of what's coming down the pipeline. Um, and then looking, once you're, you get a handle on exactly what those properties are that are publicly owned, that are available, um, determining which of those are actually eligible for the blight funding. So based on um, the activities, and that they're in residential areas, they're in key centers, they're in the nodes and the corridors that MISH is looking for. And then taking it a step further to narrow and prioritize that list. So meeting with, with the organizations you're planning to work with, the local units of government, the land banks, the CDCs. Um, again, I can't stress enough to review which properties are eligible and the guidelines that MISH has provided. Um, which are priorities for demolition within your own communities? <clears throat> is there development potential? Are they near critical assets? What is the overall impact on neighborhood stability that this light elimination project uh, will bring to the table? And then consider additional liabilities. So are there other environmental or outstanding liens? So all of these types of things can happen right now today. Um, and actually, they can happen prior to the tax foreclosure process. So even though some of those properties that were originally in forfeiture as of a week ago, and maybe the taxes were paid, in future years, you should consider doing this earlier than, than waiting until after April 1st. Um, I would encourage you in January, February, March, to have those conversations um, with your county treasurers to figure out exactly how many properties you're looking at that are, that are currently in forfeiture, where they're located, are any of them in their actual, in the target areas, and, and have those conversations earlier. Don't wait until April 1st. Um, unfortunately, the, the conversation is taking place on April 2nd, so, so we're in the time crunch now. But in the future, just think about those conversations earlier on. So once you've identified those properties, um, 
you're going to need to confirm a formal blight designation letter from a qualified municipal manager, assessor, or code enforcement officer. Those things can be happening right now. Um, because those are all things that MISH is requiring as part of the application process. So confirm the property is designated as blight based on the MISHA definitions that we went over a few slides ago. And discuss the potential end uses and purchasers for each property. Also discuss the ongoing um, property maintenance. Once you, once you demolish these properties, they're publicly owned. There's going to have to be some type of strategy in place and we need to think about that. How are we going to maintain these properties? Who's going to maintain these properties? <clears throat> so those are the things that you can be doing right now um, prior to applying for the grant funding in just a few weeks. Once your application goes in, once you have those properties identified, um, we have until July. The, the properties are currently owned by the foreclosing governmental unit. The state of Michigan has the first right of refusal process. And as I had mentioned in our, our chart, um, that they have until the first Tuesday in July to make that decision. So between April 25th, when you actually apply for that, um, the grant funding, we may be in a waiting game to hear from the state. They have to purchase the property for greater of minimum bid or fair market value. Again, not very often does this happen. Do not wait until after you hear from the state or until July 1st for to have the conversations with your local units or your counties on who's going to actually utilize the right of refusal process because for the timing of when MISHTA is actually interested in um, signing the grant letters, we don't have the timing. We still are working on a tight timeline here. So in the meantime, until we hear from the state or don't hear from the state, your local unit of government can, can utilize their right of refusal process by purchasing for minimum bid and public purpose. Public purpose needs to be determined by your legal counsel. It needs to be determined in each one of your counties. Um, so keeping that in mind, if you are with a local unit and you're looking to utilize that right of refusal, there does have to be a public purpose. That is up to your legal counsel to determine exactly how that would fit. So the um, local unit has the ability at this point in time. If the local unit will be the ones that are using the right of refusal, which means purchasing the property prior to the auction, um, they will be <clears throat> You want to have those that identified prior to uh, the July 1 deadline. So if you don't hear from the state on July 1, the local unit can exercise their right or purchase the property for the minimum bid prior to the auction. If it's going to be the county, same thing. The county can purchase for minimum bid. They do not have to have a public purpose. Again, if the county will be the ones utilizing the right of refusal, and purchasing that property prior to auction, then they will, um, that can happen at this point in time. So on July 1, you should be able to make the decision of who will own the property. Just a point of clarity, land banks by statute do not have a right of refusal. They do not have the ability to purchase property prior to auction unless they take the request to the County Board of Commissioners on a case-by-case -case basis where the County Board of Commissioners exercises their right of refusal, purchases the property prior to auction and transfers it to the land bank, or a blanket intergovernmental agreement in place between the county and the land bank, which is approved by the County Board of Commissioners. Um, so there is some misunderstanding across the state on whether or not land banks have that right of refusal. They only have that re right of refusal if approved by the county through the two bullets, either one of the bullets. So how to utilize or why you would want to partner with your city, county, or state land bank? There's a couple of different reasons. One, your current inventory, their current inventory. What properties are they currently holding that 
would meet the requirements of MISHTA for blight elimination, and that could impact the surrounding property values, the, the surrounding neighborhoods by doing blight elimination. So really having those conversations on what their current inventory looks like. And while we're talking specifically about blight elimination today and blight elimination related to this grant, these are all reasons why even nonprofits may want to have conversations with their land banks, um, both city, county, and state, for rehabilitation purposes, let's say, um, if they held properties within their target areas. So for those of you that are from nonprofit or are looking at redevelopment opportunities, rehab opportunities, new build opportunities, um, having conversations with the city, county, city or county or state land bank that may have properties in your community um, may be able, there may be a partnership that can be formed. So going back to the blight, looking for their current inventory, a lot of the land banks, there are 39 across the state of Michigan, many of them have participated in demolition either through grant funding, federal, state, or local grant funding, or through partnerships with their local units. They've completed demolition. So they have policies, procedures in place to actually implement those programs. While land banks are not eligible for this funding, they can be um, a joint recipient on the application. They also, many of them, have relationships with local CDCs and nonprofits already in place um, that they may be able to utilize some of that partnership. They also have additional programs specifically a side lot program, land banking program, and maintenance programs. And why are those important for blight elimination? So in some of our communities, when we take down a property, that the end use of that property may be a vacant lot that can be sold to a qualifying homeowner. Land banks have in place, again, policies, priorities, procedures. They have the structure for a program in place to be able to offer these properties at a discounted rate to qualifying uh, adjacent homeowners. Land banking programs are where land banks will hold properties for future redevelopment. Again, they already have the structure in place to implement these types of programs, so it's not a local unit trying to duplicate the work and or create new programs for the end use of these properties. You can utilize the programs that are within the land bank. And then also uh, maintenance. So for the maintenance programs, again, land banks have developed maintenance programs to address their maintenance issues with their current inventories. Some of them have programs like Adopt-A-Lot where they work with residents in their communities to actually mow. Some of them have intergovernmental agreements with local units to help and assist them in maintaining property. Um, they work with youth programs. Uh, they work with local businesses. So again, they have these programs established that can be utilized to maintain these properties, to hold these properties, to dispose of these properties. Um, and even if you're a local unit of government that's, that's applying for this grant funding, who's planning to handle the actual demolition of the program, it may be of interest to you to at least reach out to the city, county, or state land bank that's operating in your community to find out if they have any programs that could potentially be used at the end of the demolition process. So again, preparing for future projects, um, it is a tight timeline. We're looking at essentially two weeks for you to pull together a lot of information on properties, and whether or not you're going to meet the requirements, whether or not you can find the match, the 25% match for the grant. So what can you do now if you're not ready for um, to apply for the grant funding now that you can do now, get your, get your programs in place in order for future projects? Um, you need as a community to determine what the priorities are of the community. Um, if there's blight elimination projects that need to take place, where should those be at? Where's other targeted development taking place? Is there a broader strategy? And then develop that strategy, identify those target areas, 
look at negotiated acquisition. So maybe it's not a tax foreclosure, but there's other properties in those target areas. How can you acquire those properties publicly now so that they would qualify for funding in the future? Current inventory. Having conversations with various public units um, or public entities to find out what their current inventory is to determine if they're holding inventory in those target areas, making sure everyone's having the same conversations about the future of those target areas. Again, the future tax foreclosure process, how to utilize the right of refusal that I talked about prior, how to um, purchase those properties prior to auction, how to bundle properties, and this is something that a county treasurer is well aware of, and they are given the ability through the statute to bundle properties and take them through the tax foreclosure process, ultimately ending up with properties um, at the end. Um, forming partnerships among the local units, the land banks, and the nonprofits. We're all in this together, and so how can you leverage each, each other's funding? Um, Prepare property for future reuse. Again, identify what the reuse strategies are going to be. If there's title issues on the properties, getting those, those properties, getting clear title now, um, taking them through a quiet title process if necessary so that these properties are ready to go. They're in your pipeline for funding opportunities in the future. And then environmental assessments. If these properties, you know, there's potential contamination, how can we start getting some of that stuff cleared up? How can we get our phase ones done now, um, again, to get these properties in the pipeline? And so just doing those things now will put you in a better position in the future to apply for funding. It won't be something that will be a two-week process, but you already have your strategy in place. So I quickly just want to go back, um, as we're nearing the end of the presentation, just to reiterate a few points specifically here. So, as I mentioned, April 1st, the foreclosing governmental unit in most of the communities in Michigan, um, all but 11 counties actually, um, the county treasurer is the foreclosing governmental unit. In the 11 counties, the state is the foreclosing governmental unit. The blight component applications are due April 14th through the 25th. Again, review the NOFA that MISHTA sent out because this deadline is different than the other um, community development funding sources that are available. Um, so again, this is just for the blight component due April 14th through the 25th. The first Tuesday in July is when actually everything can take place as far as the end user. So. We foreclosed yesterday. You're making a decision on which properties, if any, that are publicly owned that were current year tax foreclosures that you want to use as part of your application process. You submit your application to MISHTA with all of the, the criteria they're requesting. We wait and see to make sure that the state is not taking those properties through the, their right of refusal. You've already had the conversations with your local units, your counties, and or your land banks to determine if they will be taking those properties prior to auction and paying the minimum bid to get those properties into publicly owned inventory. Once that happens, MISHTA will be issuing the grant funding and the actual grant letters. Um, and then from there, these, the blight elimination program can take place. So again, what you should be doing now is really looking at these properties, figuring where they're at. Are they in need of demolition? Do they meet the blight criteria? Do you have the local letters of support in place? Applying for the grant funding with those properties. MISHTA does understand that some of these properties may not be available, right? If, if a property has a bankruptcy, if there's an IRS lien, um, if there was improper notice, the, re the foreclosure could be reversed. And so those properties wouldn't be publicly owned uh, by the dates they're requiring and therefore not eligible for the grant funding. Um, if that's the case, if you have any feelings on that, you may want some additional properties um, just 
backlogged. So with that, um, again, reiterating the eligibility is for non-entitlement local units of government. And the basis of this presentation is really on the blight funding that's available through MISHTA. Um, the guidelines are much different than the other sources of funding, and so I would encourage you to go back and review the NOFA and look at um, the, the criteria for those programs as well. With that, I think we can go ahead and open it up for questions. Okay. I do have a couple right off the top. Um, the first is, what does the right of refusal mean? Sure. So the right of refusal process is when the state, local unit, or county exercises to purchase the property prior to the first tax foreclosure auction by paying the minimum bid. This slide here talks about what, what each unit has to do. So the state of Michigan would have to purchase for greater minimum bid or fair market value. The local unit has to pay the minimum bid and or the public and have a public purpose. The county has to pay the minimum bid. If a land bank works with their county, has an agreement with their county to be the ultimate end user of the property, they also have to pay the minimum bid. So the local units of government are made whole. Um, the county is made whole by the amount of taxes that were owed on the property at the time of the foreclosure. So it's the state of okay. Um, okay, so the next question is, so in your opinion, is it impossible to apply for this round of funding by, by April 25th with properties that were just foreclosed on April 1st? No. Um, as long as the community has some idea of what their targeted areas are and their strategies, it's going to be close. It's going to take some work, and it's going to take um, some undivided attention. Um, but with the $50,000 minimum um, and having it be residential homes, um, it's going to be a couple properties, not just one. I think that, that they can um, absolutely get an application in, get a strong application in, and get the requirements, but I think that the work – there has to have been at least some conversations about target areas. Um, there has to be some idea of the properties that are out there. And I can bet that your county treasurer or your land bank, if you have one, have a good idea of properties that they've just been waiting for um, to be tax foreclosed because they're a blight and they're a detriment on the community. Tanya, I don't know if you have anything to add um, as far as will they be able to actually apply for the funding at this point? Yeah, I think it's going to depend on how much time you have to devote to making sure that you have all of your paperwork ready to submit before the window deadline. Okay. Um, does the 25% match have to be cash match or can it be services? has to be cash match. Okay. Is there another way for entitlement communities to access these or similar funds? Um, entitlement communities cannot access these dollars because they're CDBG dollars. However, we have other programs such as NSP1 or NSP2 or the um, state by elimination program. So it depends on where they're located and what they're eligible for. but. There are blight programs available out there outside of um, these specific dollars. Okay. Are there any other questions? There haven't there hasn't there aren't any other questions coming in, but I'm just going to wait another minute or two just in case anybody is typing or... Okay. Okay, well, I think that that wraps up the questions that we had for this particular webinar. 
Um, so in closing, was there anything that you wanted to say, Courtney or Tanya, regarding this program? No, just thank you um, for your time this afternoon. And if you have any other further questions, please feel free to, to reach out um, if there are compliance-related questions to Tanya at NISHTA or um, to our office, Community Progress Flint office. We'd be happy to answer any questions related to the actual tax foreclosure process. Wonderful. Thank you so much to all of you for participating and to Tanya and Courtney for taking the time out to present on this this program. Um, if you're ever interested in anything else that the Michigan Vac Vacant Properties Campaign is doing or that CEDAM is doing, please feel to, to visit us at CEDAM.info, um, and you can always call me. My name is Lisa Bank again. I'm the Communications and Training Specialist here at CEDAM. I can be reached at B as in boy, E-N-C-K, at C-E-D-A-M.info. Um, thank you so much, and enjoy this wonderful spring weather.